First John chapter three. First John chapter three. This is going to be the last time you guys see me until next Wednesday. I'll be going to North Carolina for Labor Day weekend. Um, very excited about that. Spending just a time with a couple family friends of ours and enjoying some true southern sweet tea. Not the um, fake stuff that McDonald's has. Uh, shots fired. Shots fired. Um, so you, you, want, you want actually really good sweet tea. Miss Angela Ripple is a great uh, sweet tea maker. So if you ever want her uh, to make you some sweet tea, let her know and she'll probably get Luke to do it. And um, that'll be that'll be really great. Luke has mastered that one too, so I'll give you that one, buddy. First John chapter three. I will not be long today, and I'm not going to teach anything brand new, which is always a good thing. Rather, I just want us to live in a simple reminder that we already know, and just be reminded of some truth. First John chapter three. <clears throat> And we'll begin reading in verse number one. The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we shall become the, excuse me, we shall be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it, do, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Father, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, we have to look in your word. I just pray that you'll help us to get the truth out of these few verses that we read. And Father, I just pray that you will uh, be able to speak through me, dear Lord. Cleanse me of sin, and to me of myself, dear Lord. And I just pray that you'll speak through me, that whatever thus saith the Lord, and we'll be sure to give you all the honor and glory for it. We ask this in your name. Amen. So in verse, uh, excuse me, uh, verse John chapter 3, we're introduced to a term that we have heard before, or if you've studied First John, you probably have seen before, and it's the term, the Son of God, or an equivalent term would be the children of God, and this is how John describes you and I. So being a child of God is not the first time that we actually see this in First John, we see it in actually... Uh, 1 John chapter 2, just a couple verses before it's mentioned in verse 1, and then we see it throughout the rest of the book in John uh, chapter 3, chapter 4, verse 18, and chapter 5, and I believe it's verse number 1 in chapter 5, we see a phrase, Son of God or children of God, that's actually used. Now, everyone here is a part of a family, uh, whether it be a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a husband, a wife, a cousin, an uncle, an aunt, a grandmother, whatever it may be, you're part of a family. As for me, I am part of the Grant family. Tajmane Cordero Grant is my name. That's the name that I was given through birth. And because of that, I am part of the Grant family. And when you're part of a family, you have particular characteristics. Uh, the most, in my opinion, the most notable characteristic of a Grant is the fact that they love to eat. Uh, food is a absolute pertinent thing in any type of family gathering. I don't think I've ever visited a family member without eating, regardless of the fact if I ate at home or not. I always had the third or the fourth meal, or the fifth meal even sometimes, at uh, some of our family members' houses, because that's just how it is. Uh, I go to the Price's house sometimes, and I go hungry, and sometimes I leave hungry, because uh, they, well, they eat carrots and stuff like that, and I need like some grease, I need some salt, um, I need some things with just a lot of ketchup, a lot of seasonings, and just all of that, and that's just how grants are. We, we, we love to cook, we love to feed each other, we love to eat what other people have fed uh, us, and that's just how a grant is. Another thing about the grants, we're hard workers. Uh, I, I probably am the least example of, of a grant, but um, my aunts and my uncles and my dad and my stepmother, they all really work hard. They, they, they've done really well uh, for themselves and they make a living and they don't make a lot of money. We're not rich. We don't have millions of dollars, but we do with what we have and we do with it very well. And, you know, another characteristic and the final one that I'll mention is I think grants are passionate. We're very passionate people. We're lovers. We love to love and we love to be loved. We're very touchy. Everyone hugs in our family. And you guys would probably be really uncomfortable with my family if you're around them sometimes. But we're all lovers. We all hug. And that's just how we are. And I'm sure your family has traits as well. There are things about your family that you can say, yeah, 
we do this, we're this kind of way. If you were to see this, I could tell you that that's my son or my daughter, or you can tell that that is a so-and-so. You can tell that they are a part of our family. There's just characteristics about uh, our families that define us. And it's the same thing when you and I are part of the family of God. And so as we study in 1 John, we see some of these characteristics. They're kind of brought up every now and again, but here we're seeing some of the things that we are, we are called the children or the sons of God. And Christian, do not forget who you belong to. Uh, don't forget that you are God's. You accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and He is the one that you follow. He is the one that is your Heavenly Father. Don't forget that that's the one that you answer to. You don't answer to your coworker. You don't answer to your family. You don't answer to your work or to this world predominantly over God. That's not the case. You're a child of God. You're the son of the living God. And the fact of the matter is, because that's what the Bible calls us in uh, 1 John 3, that's who we answer to. We answer to God. We answer to God for our lives. We answer to God for the things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we think, how we use our time, the time that we use for him. And he's the one that we answer to. And he's the one that we ought to live for. We ought to take ourselves out of it. We don't live for ourselves because the life that we have is not ours. It has nothing to do with you, it has nothing to do with me, it has, it's not in our possession. Rather, it's everything that God has, it's everything for God and to God, and that's who we belong to. And so the Bible tells us that we shall be called the sons of God. That is our title when you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. So what does that entail? What does that necessarily have? There's just a couple things that I want us to see, and we'll be done tonight, I will not be long. And the first thing is what we are when the Bible says that we are the sons of God. And the first thing we say it is in John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. What you and I are as sons of God is the recipient of God's love. What you and I are when we are called the sons of God or when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're adopted into that family, is receive, we receive the love of the Father. His love is given to us. By the way, in order for you to have that love, or in order for you to have that title of the child of God or sons of God, it pretty much had to be God's love in the first place that got you there. Think of John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You and I, that's Romans 5, 8. And just the next page over in 1 John 4, you don't have to turn there, but in verse 9, the Bible says, um, I just lost it, here it is, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. It's his love that allowed us to be into that family in the first place. And that love does not die when you and I are accepted into that family, when we accept Jesus Christ and our Savior. And Christian, that ought to make you smile. That ought to make you happy. I know there are a lot of Christians that are just really struggling with the idea of, man, nobody loves me. Not a single person in this world. I know Christians who don't even have connections with some of the closest people in their lives, and that should be their family. I know Christians who don't even have that. I know Christians who think that they don't even have people they can call friends. I, I know Christians that think that they're just so alone, and there's just nobody that they can turn to, and there's nobody that loves them. And the fact of the matter is you can have no greater love than what the Father can give you. And that ought to make us uh, just really rejoice. And Christian, we ought to stop living like nobody loves us too. You're, we ought to stop living like nobody really cares or nobody really loves us. Or we ought to stop living like God doesn't love that. I've heard people say that I don't think God loves me anymore. I've heard people say that. Whether they're saved or not, I, I can't give you that. But I've heard people say, well, I know that God doesn't just love me anymore. Look what's going on in my life. Look at everything that's just falling apart. Look what's happening. The love of God is never lost if you're a child of God. God doesn't ever love you less. God doesn't ever stop loving you. God chastises in love. We do see that. That's a biblical teaching. Yeah, that happens when you and I sin, when you and I fall into sin. You know, God says, hey, that's sin. 
Sometimes I have to chastise you, but he even says he does it in love. And we're a recipient of that love. Man, I thank God for the fact that I can wake up in the morning and God still loves me. Do you know who I am? I am nothing worse than a sinner, or nothing better than a sinner. I struggle with sin daily. I struggle with things all the time. I betray God almost all the time. Anytime I open my mouth, sometimes my sin gets in the way. Anything that I do, sometimes my sin gets in the way. And I am just a complete wreck at times. And what happens? God still loves me. The fact of the matter is, I'm a child of God. That's how we have to see it. No, we shouldn't take advantage of it. Oh, I'm just going to jump into sin. All right, that's cool. I mean, God will still love me for it. That, that's, that's taking advantage of it. And no, we ought not, not, excuse me, ought not to live like that. But the fact of the matter is God still loves us. We ought to live like he loves us. And by the way, you ought to exude that love too. You ought to show people that Christ-like love. I know it's tough at times. There are people that we just don't get along with. There are people that really rub us the wrong way. There are people that we bump heads with. But we ought to love them like Christ, especially if they're our brothers and sisters. Why? They're part of our family. We are the children of God. If we are adopted to the family of God, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ in that essence. And God loved you enough to die for you. And by the way, that person that you may be upset with, God died for them too. And God wants to use you, maybe even to help them in their lives. And you can't do that if you don't love them. I ought to show that love. You ought to show that Christ-like love. The love that says, okay, God, I know you did everything for me. You sent your son to die on the cross for me. And because of that, I know I receive your love. And help me exude that love as well. We're the recipients of the love of God. We're the recipients of God who loves, or the love that God gives us. What are we? We're the recipients of that. Verse 1 continues on. Therefore the world knows, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Gives the idea that not only are we the recipients of love when we are called the sons of God, but the fact of the matter is, the world doesn't really recognize us. It's kind of the truth, isn't it? When someone gets saved, Christians celebrate, but you don't necessarily see it on CNN. It's not necessarily on Fox News. It's not necessarily broadcasted unless you have, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 Facebook friends. And you want to put it in the fact that, yeah, I led Charlie to the Lord today. Hashtag not about me. You know, you want to do something like that. Um, outside of that, it, it's not really groundbreaking news. The world doesn't ever pay attention to the fact that you and I love the Lord. At least to the essence of... Yeah, it's this grand scheme of things. Now, there are people who do pay attention to our lives and notice that we do have the Christ-like joy. There are people who pay attention to our lives and notice that the Holy Spirit does live in us. And yes, by God's grace, through our testimony, there are people who want to have that. And that's how they're led to the Lord. But when we're talking about the grand scheme of things, it's kind of swept under the rug, isn't it? Oftentimes, actually... The world doesn't pay attention to when a Christian does right. They notice when the Christian, though, does wrong. That often seems to be true. Um, I was debating on using this analogy for a while. I'm going to go ahead and use it. Uh, of course, there's the um, tragedy that's going on in Houston right now, the Hurricane Harvey, um, just, you know, doing its particular damage. And um, the person that has been under a lot of heat lately is Joel Olstein. Now... Before I continue with that sentence, I don't agree very much, if anything at all, with a lot of what Joel Osteen preaches. Um, God knows his heart, I do not. But I don't know if he's saved. I, don't, I wouldn't say this is the pinnacle Christian that you have to follow. If he is such, I don't know. God knows his heart. That, I have my opinion. My opinion doesn't matter. But I always find it interesting that in the world's viewpoint, Joel Olstein is a preacher, and because they don't know any better, they kind of establish the church as one big conglomerate. So, you know, if you're a Christian, then you're probably associated with Joel Olstein or some, whatever it may be. And Joel Olstein got a lot of flack. A lot of flack for not opening his church to some of the people who need a place to stay. For those of you who don't know, his church, he's a pastor of a megachurch in Houston, about 17,000, I think, people or so. Um, his building 
was actually the old uh, stadium for the Houston Rockets before they moved into their new stadium. So he basically has an NBA arena for his building, if you will. You know, and so he has all these thousands of people that come and they recite something at the beginning. Of the, anyway, I'm rap trailing. <laughs> Um, anyway, so he has all these, and he has this big building, and um, he got a lot of flack. Oh, you hypocrites! What would Jesus have done? Jesus would have let everybody in Houston come stay in this big building. You know, how dare you? I don't know the man's motive. I don't know the man's heart. Now, now they're in. Now, I think it was this morning. Uh, he started letting people in, and, you know, people are there now. But he received a lot of flack for the past couple of days. He got a lot of flack for it. And the world is really fast to catch you on your hypocrisy, if you will. They're really fast to catch you on when you're wrong. Because when you're wrong in their logic, when you're wrong, what you believe is flawed. Because you're wrong, you didn't do it, so you don't believe it in their mind. But the, the idea that we're getting here is that the world is really quick to say, hey, you can't be a Christian, and if you are, don't tell me what to do. I don't want to recognize that. And they kind of put us in this group of, oh, you're just one of those religious people. That, that, that always gets under my skin. I, I, I don't like being defined as a religious person, if you will. It's not a religion. But the fact of the matter is, that's what the world sees you as. And they don't, they don't see eye to, eye to us. They don't know you. They won't recognize you. And Christian, you ought to be really, really careful with trying to be recognized by the world. You ought to be very, very careful with trying to blend in with the world. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to blend in so much that the world is only going to see themselves in you. The only difference is you may say Jesus a little more. But the fact of the matter is you're going to continue to just, just try to blend and blend. And that's the problem that we're having with a lot of churches. The churches are not trying to separate themselves, which is a part in John 3 that we'll look at later. Rather, they're trying to integrate themselves into the world. And they're trying to blend together with what the world believes. And we're not really having any spiritual growth because nobody is willing to step aside and say, I'm God's, I am the child of God, and that is who I answer to, not the world. And we ought to be very careful with just trying to blend in with what God, or excuse me, with what the world says or with what the world believes. Because the Bible says that they don't recognize you. They don't know you because they don't know him or they knew him not. And that's what happens. Now, again, I totally believe that through the testimony that you live, with people seeing the joy of Christ and the Holy Spirit living in you, and people seeing the fact that you're willing to take the correct steps. I believe, and I've seen it plenty of times, that people say, man, I want what he has. And they get saved because of it. But be careful, Christian, if the world gets really comfortable with you because they don't see you as a threat. You heard? Be careful when the world says, yeah, he says he's a Christian, but we're going to go get drinks later. So it is what it is. Or he says the same things that I do. Or he does the same thing that I do. I do. It's, it's, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. No. The Bible tells us in just a couple verse later we ought to be set apart and be separate. And we'll talk about that in a second. So what are we? We're recipients of God's love. And also, we're not recognized by the world. In verse number 2, the Bible tells us what we shall be. And we look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Beloved. Now we are the sons of God, so after we accept Jesus Christ our Savior, this is what we are, we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Bible tells us that we don't know exactly, it hasn't been fully revealed what we'll be, be like. Now, as you study the Bible, you know that we will have a different body, we'll have a spiritual body. Um... That body is immortal. It does not die. So when we are, are caught up, we'll have a different body. And eternity goes on. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about dying. We don't have to worry about anything. And, and we understand that. But in particulars, the Bible doesn't necessarily say it. The Bible doesn't say I'm going to be a six foot four, 195-pound ripped stud with a great beard that doesn't get nappy and the appetite to eat anything and not gain weight. Uh, that's my idea of a perfect body. That's going to be awesome. Uh, but the Bible doesn't necessarily tell that. The Bible doesn't necessarily tell us 
uh, the specifics of what is going to be revealed. But what we know is that we're going to be like Jesus. We won't be Jesus. We didn't die for the sins of the whole world, but we will be like him. We'll be just like him. The Bible says that we will be like the heavenly man. And that's the idea. We're going to be made in his image, if you will, and we'll be like him. And by the way, it's a perfect reason to start trying to live like him now. It's a perfect reason to start trying to be like him now. I, I had this idea, and, and it's, just, it's purely an idea, and I don't like preaching ideas or anything like that. But in, in my mind, I see that the more that I live like Christ, the easier it will be for me to be transformed like Christ. Rather than going through all my sin and all of my darkness and all my dirt and everything like that and trying to go all, all through that to be more to be like Christ, to transform like Christ. We don't necessarily see this transformation thing in the Bible, but in my mind it's like, man, it only makes sense that if I, for the rest of eternity, am going to be like Christ, why not start now? Why not start living for Christ now? Why not start doing the things for Christ today? Why not start to try to grow at this moment? Why not try to be more sanctified this second? Why not try to be like my Savior who died for me at the very minute that I'm living in? Because after all, we will, we will be like Him for the rest of eternity when He does come and when He does catch us up. And that's what you and I have to look forward to as children of God, as the sons of God. The fact of the matter is we will be like Christ. Do you have any idea how much easier things would be if we were like Christ? If we didn't have to battle our flesh every day? If doing the right thing was the easiest and the simplest thing? That would just be absolutely remarkable. If we didn't have to battle our flesh, if we didn't have to battle the sin nature that's in our bodies all the time. If we can do the right thing at every step, in every way, it's kind of a big challenge, isn't it? I have a tough time just trying to do the right thing by getting up early enough so that way I can do what I need to do and get to work and just minute things like that. But when it comes to big decisions in life, when it, becomes, when it comes to doing what God wants us to do in the world, it will be great to where we can get to a point of ease where we say, God said it and that's all I'm going to do. And that's it. And it will be great when we get to that transformed state, but it will be even more greater. That's horrible grammar. It'll be even greater if, don't laugh at me, Daniel. It'll be even greater if we can practice that now with the sin-cursed body, with this written world that, that is on their way to hell if they don't have Jesus. It'll be awesome if we can say, yeah, God said it. It's in his word, and that's all I'm going to do, and nothing else is going to change my mind about it. And that'll be something that'll be amazing for God to say, yes, that's exactly what Taj did. Yes, that's exactly what the person in your seat, the, per the reflection in your mirror that you look at, that's what that person did. And that's not what we ought to strive for, because we will be like him. So what are we? We're recipients of his love, and we are not recognized by the world. What we shall be, we're going to be like him. We're going to be like Jesus. So what should you and I ought to be? What is it that you and I ought to be right now? We see that in verse number three. The Bible says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. What we ought to be is taking that step of being pure. Purifying ourselves, Purifying what we do. Purifying what we say. Uh, the word purity comes from the Greek word, uh, excuse me, hagnizo, which means to make clean. We didn't need necessarily Greek to understand. We know what purity means, to make something clean, to make something spotless or without blemish or anything like that or without stain. This is kind of a synonym to holiness. And it gives, verse 3, gives the idea of setting ourselves apart. Another word that you and I know begins with S is sanctification. It is sanctifying ourselves, setting ourselves apart from what? Anything that's not Jesus. Anything that's going to take us away from Jesus. Uh, setting ourselves away from sin, setting ourselves away from the things of the world and being more like Christ. 
And Christian, you and I ought to try to set ourselves apart and continue to work to purify ourselves. How do we do that? We just continually read the word and we do what God tells us to do. We have that live, vivacious relationship with God that will continue to help us to grow. And when that happens, we'll see the things that we used to struggle with. We'll see the sins that we used to have that just really bogged us down and say, man, thank God I now have victory over that. And of course, our purest stage will be the stage of glorification. But it doesn't give you a reason why you can't work towards purity now. It doesn't give you an excuse saying, well, I'm never going to be truly pure, truly perfect, if you will. No, we're all called to be Christ-like, and to be as he is, and Christ is pure. Christ is perfect. We ought to strive towards who we need to be like. I, I, I get so upset at myself sometimes when I desire the things that the world would want me to desire. There's nothing pure about what the world wants. What does the world want? Money. The world wants tons of money. What does the world want? Fame. The world wants tons of fame. The world wants tons of power. The world wants tons of drama. And when did any of that have any sort of stand in front of God? Never. Never did. And it never will. God doesn't care about your dollar amount. God doesn't care about the level of success that you have. God doesn't care about those things. And sometimes we just get so caught up with it. Maybe not the idea of fame, but just the things of this world. We get so caught up with what the world thinks is right. We get so caught up with what the world says is okay and what the world says is right. And really, we ought to set ourselves apart from that and work towards purity. Work towards purifying ourselves. Why in the world would we want to live for the world and like the world if you're a child of God? If you are a child of of God. My parents don't say this very often, but I have aunts and uncles who do this very much and say, hey, when you leave this house, don't you forget that you're a grant and do what a grant ought to do. There's nothing special about a grant. There's nothing special about me. We're not the pinnacle of morality. But you know what? You're a child of God. And as you go on about your day, and as you go on about your life, and as you go about the things that you do, remember that you are a child of God, and that's who you represent. And do what God would want you to do. Do the things that God would want you to do. Say the things that God would want you to say. Be the Christian that God would want you to be. You will be miserable, Christian, if you try to please your Father and please the world. It's never going to happen. There is no possibility to that. There's no good middle ground. You'll never succeed. No one has ever succeeded, and no one will ever succeed in trying to please one and please the other. But what I've heard uh, preachers call gray Christianity, it, it, it doesn't work. It, it's not going to be fun. In fact, it's just going to drive you crazy. Forget what the world has for you, Christian. Because at the end of the day, it's all going to end. But your life for Christ matters. And how long does it matter for? All of eternity. Now, am I going to invest in something that's literally going to end? Or am I going to invest in something where my return value doesn't ever end? The logical business thing is the eternal side. And make the spiritually wise choice as well. Don't invest in what this world has for you. You're a child of God. You have an inheritance waiting for you. You have something that is yours for all of eternity. Go claim it. Go live that life. Live that life. Be proud of the fact that you're a child of God. I am proud of the fact that I am Grant. We are flawed as ever, and I love it. I love every bit of it. Because I love my family. But even more, I love the fact that I can be called a child of God. And what is waiting for me is so much more valuable than what the world can give me today. Regardless of the commas that can be in that check. Regardless of the Instagram followers or the, the fame, if you will, that I could have. Regardless of any of that. What God can give me is so much more. Teenager, lady, man, child, live like you are a child of God. God will bless you for it. Father, we love you.
Thank you so much for the truth that we learned today. Thank you for everything that you've taught us. And I just pray that we'll be able to apply it. In your name. Amen. Okay. Um, that's customary. What we usually do. We will take prayer requests.